We are in the middle of a series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and Paul lays all of that out for us in Galatians chapter 5. Matter of fact, he names them in verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the nine traits or characteristics of the Spirit-filled life. This is what it looks like to live by the Spirit. And when you're living by the Spirit, all nine of these things will be present in your life. The last time I was with you before we left on our trip to Africa and Spain, we were talking about joy. Today, I want us to look at peace. And and to do that, I want us to turn to Philippians chapter 4. And technically, I could have had you turn to Philippians chapter 4 the last time I was with you when we talked about joy. Because the entire theme of the book of Philippians is joy. But in this passage that is primarily about joy, Paul gives us some profound insight on how to possess real biblical peace. Look at Philippians 4 and see what Scripture has to say about real peace. Verse 4, it says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Every week, we've tried to answer four questions about each facet of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This week, it's peace. So what is the biblical definition of peace? What is the exact opposite of biblical peace? What is the counterfeit of real peace? And what attribute of God does this kind of peace originate from? Because if we can understand the attribute or the trait and characteristic of God that real peace originates from, where it springs from, when we pursue that characteristic in God, that's what cultivates that fruit in us. So we're going to look at that. The world is desperately craving this kind of peace. In nearly three and a half decades of public ministry, there's never been a time that I have seen so many believers living without it. And if you tend to be a worrier or you tend to be anxious about life or you just feel like it's hard to walk in peace in this insane world of chaos and instability, then lean in today. This is going to be a really practical and biblical journey on how to mature into the supernatural peace of God. And let me start right from the beginning by talking about the number one thing that will destroy your peace, wrong expectations. Possessing real biblical peace is a matter of having the right expectations about life. And let me frame it this way. Um... Haley and I moved here from a rural community. Both of us grew up in rural communities, and we've kind of adjusted to the big city way of life in Dallas. And Dallas is a little different than other big cities and how far you have to travel to get anywhere. Um, you know, and I can now, even now, when, when we have friends visit us from rural communities, whether in Texas or Arkansas or wherever they may be from, and we say, hey, let's hop in the car, let's go grab dinner, and we're just driving across town. And I remember when my mom was with me, she's like, where are we going, Amarillo? Like, like no, it's just McKinney, you know, I mean, like, we're going over to Frisco to grab something. In her mind, uh, we, you know, we, we used to track you know, how long does it take to get there? We'd say five miles because five miles is five minutes. In Dallas, we don't talk about miles. Five miles can take you an hour. It just depends on what time of day you decide to leave. But for us, you know, it takes me an hour and a half some days to get to the airport. And, you know, in my mindset, that's normal. I'm just driving across town. That feels local. But where I grew up to drive on an hour and a half was a road trip. For us, it's just going to the airport. It's it, it, the reality what is normal for us 
is so different for them because our expectations are different. We become accustomed to a different set of expectations. In a simple but powerful way, C.S. Lewis makes that point that it's our expectations that govern our responses in life. He says, if you're shown a hotel room and you've been told is the honeymoon suite, your expectations will be high. If there's no plush carpet and spa, you'll be disappointed. On the other hand, if you've been told before the door opens it's a jail cell, you'll be delighted to find even modest comforts. The difference between your disappointment or your delight over the same room rests squarely on your expectations. And this is so true in life. Your expectations are the filter through which you read and see and experience what happens in life. Your expectations determine your response. Your expectations determine whether or not you live with overwhelming peace or overwhelming anxiety. A lot of Christians are discouraged all the time because they don't expect attacks on their peace, which is inevitable in this life. For one reason or another, you didn't think it was going to be this way. So you're now surprised that you're surprised, and you're sad that you're sad, and you're upset that you're upset. At least half of being upset is the anger and the guilt and the frustration we feel because in, we went into this thinking it wasn't supposed to be this way. This was not our expectations. We had the wrong expectations. Far too many people come to Jesus with misguided expectations. They think Jesus is supposed to be just some value added in their life. Like he's supposed to make their life better. They're just looking for sugar that will sweeten the bitter in life. So they come to Jesus hoping that he's the sugar. They give their life to him expecting everything to get easier. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Jesus never said that. The apostles never said that. As a matter of fact, Jesus says the exact opposite. He's trying to set the expectations of his disciples when he says in John 16, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. And then he starts talking to them about expectations. This is how you have peace. Regulate your expectations. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. These are to be expected. He's saying your peace is come, will come when you have the right expectations, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, Jesus is not saying, you have to lower the expectations to think you're just going to have misery all of life. No, there is hope. He has overcome the world. You read the last chapter of the book, we win the battle. There is hope and joy in the midst of the chaos, but to live as if you're no longer going to have trial and sorrow is to have the wrong expectations, and that's going to destroy your peace. He connects our peace to possessing the proper expectations. Trouble, sorrow, expect it. Don't let it surprise you. It's a part of the human experience. Here's the gospel truth. When you give your life to Jesus, you don't have less enemies, you have more. As a follower of Jesus, you have more enemies than someone who is not. Here's why. Before you became a Christian, you had one real enemy, God. Not because he's mean, but because your life and your will were at war with him. Your will, your pride, your ego was at war with what God wanted for your life. I read a story that illustrates this perfectly. In a recent flash flood, some teenage boys saw a kitten clinging to a piece of driftwood floating down the drainage ditch, and, and somehow in the rain and the flood, it washed it into the ditch, and it was clinging for life onto this log, scared out of its mind. Several of the boys tried to swim out and rescue the kitten, but every time she fought them, she clawed them, she bit them, she scratched them, she was going to war with the very people that were trying to save her, because in her panic, she saw her rescuers as a threat and she was convincing enough that she deterred all of the boys until one of them decided he would just 
take the punishment. He would just endure it for however long it took to get the kitten back to safety. So he swam out, grabbed her by the back of the neck, and she bit and clawed and scratched. His arm was bloody, but he endured the pain to make the rescue with the kitten fighting him the whole time. She's fighting the one who's trying to save her. And I thought, wow, what a picture of God's pursuit of us. The Bible tells us that we are born with a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is hostile to God. The book of Romans says it this way. Paul says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. We are born with it. And it is hostile to God. Before Jesus changes our heart, we can't love his law. We can't love his will. We can't love his ways. We're incapable of it because our will is at war with our rescuer. But the minute you make peace with God, and that is the only way you find any other peace, is to start by making peace with God. The way to the peace of God, the Bible says, Paul writes in Romans, is you have to have peace with God. That's, that's how it all starts. So when you make peace with God, all of God's enemies declare war on you. And they're not nice enemies. Before you became a Christian, your main enemy was a good guy. He was trying to rescue you because he loves you and he cares about you. And he was doing everything he could to wake you up from your spiritual apathy. And now that you've chosen him, all your enemies are bad enemies. And here are the three main enemies of the Christian. Three main enemies of your peace. Number one, the world, which is a cultural mindset. Okay, that, that's enemy number one. Enemy number two is your own flesh, your own sinful nature that is bent away from God's will and your pride, your ego, doing it your own way. Okay, that, that, that's two. And three is the devil. There's real spiritual warfare. And I've had people say to me, man, you seem like a really intelligent guy to go on believing in the devil and demons and all of that. And my response to them is in the history of the world, the people that don't are a very small minority. The majority of people that have ever lived in every culture around the world understand the reality of spiritual warfare. And if you don't, you're a small fraction of the people who have ever lived on the face of this earth. And if you don't have the right expectations going into this life, you're going to get pummeled. You're going to be constantly discouraged by the world, by your own sin nature, and by your spiritual enemy. If, if, you, if you start thinking differently, start seeing yourself as a soldier in the middle of an intense battle. And I, I think that's proper imagery because the Bible uses that imagery. If you start seeing yourself as a soldier in the context of a battle, then you know that you can never go to battle underestimating or overestimating your enemy. If you overestimate your enemy, you're going to retreat. You're going to surrender. You're going to ultimately lose. If you underestimate your enemy, you're going to come to battle with inappropriate and insufficient resources. And I'm afraid far too many Christians came to faith with the wrong set of expectations. Nobody told you you were going to war. And so I'm telling you now when you give your life to Jesus, you have nastier, meaner, and more spiteful enemies than ever before. And every single one of them is out to destroy your salvation. They can't do that because Jesus said so. He said in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me, and He is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Your enemies are trying to destroy your salvation, but you heard Jesus, they can't do that. So the only thing they can do is make you totally ineffective and miserable by destroying your peace and your joy. A few verses earlier in that same conversation, Jesus says this in John 10.10, 10, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. The thieves in your life are the world, the culture, its mindset, your own sinful nature that is bent against God and Satan. They want to steal, kill, and destroy your peace. But what is real peace? When Paul says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is peace. What does he mean? 
Here's the definition of biblical peace. Biblical peace is the confidence and trust in God's wise control of your life. It's resting in the sovereign wisdom of God more than your own. So if that's the definition of biblical peace, the opposite of biblical peace is anxiety and worry because you don't trust God's good, just, and wise control over whatever has unsettled you. When you're living by the Spirit, when you're walking in the peace of God, there's a steadiness in your life. There's a genuine rest that can come to you in the midst of the battle because you possess such resolute trust in God's goodness and in God's control. Hell can unleash its fury around you. Life can be unfair. People and situations can be unjust. But all the while, you stay steady. You're at peace because you trust His wise control of your life more than your own. The opposite of this steadiness is worry and anxiety. This is what Paul is trying to tell us in the Philippians 4 passage we read in the beginning. Look at it again. Look at verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Are you want to know what to do to get your peace? Pray about everything, number one. Tell God what you need. That means make your request known to God, number two. Number three, thank Him for all He's done. So your prayers, so when when worry and anxiety comes, turn it into prayer. Turn it into a request. Turn that worry into a request that is made known to God and do it all with a mindset of gratitude and thanksgiving. Then you will experience God's peace. Where does this kind of peace come from? By praying about everything, by making your request known to God, turning the worry into a request of God, and doing it all with the heart of thanksgiving. That's the key. Notice what Paul says. All your requests have to be presented to God with thanksgiving. But how am I supposed to be thankful for something that God has not yet even done in my life? And the answer to that question is the secret. It's the key to biblical peace. When you thank God before or while you are making your request, you're saying that. This is what you're saying. Lord, whatever you do in response to this request is good because I trust that you are good and wise and sovereign. I thank you in advance for your sovereign wisdom. If I'm asking for something in the wrong time, and you don't give it to me, I thank you for that. If you give me something that's the opposite of what I ask, even though it's difficult, I'm going to trust you. I know that you know what you're doing. I thank you for ordering my life better than I can. I rest in your control of all circumstances and all situations. That's the key. To thank God ahead of time for the things that you request of Him. That's the secret. There's a peace that starts governing your life when this is your mindset. It's confidence in God's wise control of your life. And that kind of peace is what the world is searching for, but they can never find. It's the very thing that Hollywood portrays in all of our heroes, our screen heroes, Our novel book heroes, they're they're always cool and calm and collected in the face of danger. They have this aura about them, a confidence, a stability that sets them apart in the story and makes them the hero. Whether it was John Wayne in the past or Liam Neeson or Matt Damon or Jennifer Lawrence, the characters they play on the screen always possess a confidence and a stability in the face of chaos. If the chaos is getting to everybody else, it doesn't get to them. That's the trait the screenwriters put in our own screen heroes because they know that's what the heart of humanity is craving and that kind of movie, that story is going to sell. We need somebody that is steady and stable, somebody to look to in a world of chaos. But what you see on the movie screen or in the novel is counterfeit versions of real peace. It's a worldly version of it. Why? How do I, why do I say that? Don't forget what we've been saying every week. The fruit of the Holy Spirit are one. There are not nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. There are nine facets of the same fruit. So when I live by the Spirit, 
It means that I possess all nine facets of the same time. I possess the fruit of the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you can artificially manufacture one or two of these nine things. Like our heroes in the movies, they often have a confidence and a stability, but it comes at the expense of their joy or their love or their kindness or their self-control. And the same is true of us. Many people around us, maybe even you, look like that you have peace. You're never going to let anybody see you sweat. You look like you've got it all together on the outside. But here's what's really happening. You're becoming indifferent. There's an indifference and an apathy, a way of hardening your heart to the point that you don't care anymore. And on the outside, it looks like you have peace. But the way that you can tell if it's counterfeit peace or real peace, if it's a counterfeit fruit or real spiritual fruit, is because real spiritual fruit never exists by itself. A person that is hard-hearted or that has this aura of peace, but that's the only thing they've got, they're not tender-hearted, they're not loving, they're not joyful, they're not approachable, they're not humble. If all the fruit is not there, it's not real peace. If you have stability and confidence, but no joy and kindness and gentleness, then what you have is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit's peace. So the counterfeit of biblical peace is an indifference, apathy, and hardened heart with an I don't care attitude. To that person and to those on the outside watching that person, it can appear as if they have peace. They don't. Jonathan Edwards in his great book, Religious Affection, says the only way you can be sure if a person's peace, joy, love, patience, kindness, and all of that is not counterfeit is that it all happens together. There's a symmetry about them. They grow together. And only the Spirit of God can supernaturally produce that symmetry in us. Only the Spirit of God can create an emotionally healthy, kind, loving tender-hearted, generous person who is also self-controlled, dependable, rock-solid, and an absolutely peaceful person. Now, we don't start out this way the day we come to Christ. That's why they are called fruit. They have to grow. And the fruit of the Spirit grows in us as we mature in Christ. That's how we grow in peace. We mature to the place in our relationship with God that we have total trust in His wisdom and in His sovereign control of our lives, even if we don't understand or like what is going on around us. That's also why our lack of trust in His wisdom and His control of our lives produces the opposite of peace, which is worry and anxiety. And that's really what worry is. At its core, worry is distrust in God's wisdom and control of your life. Now let me go down a a little side road for a minute and point something out about anxiety because it's such a major issue in our world today. The word for anxiety in the Greek, and the reason the Greek matters is that's what the New Testament was originally written in, and sometimes we lose something in translation, so it's good to go back. The word for anxiety is, and I have it there for you in the Greek alphabet. I can't read it not familiar as I should be with the Greek alphabet, but translated, transliterated into Eng, in, in, in English letters, it's merimna, and it literally means to split, divide, or be in pieces. That's what anxiety means, to split, divide, or be in pieces. And this becomes incredibly clear in a conversation that Jesus has with, with Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus in Luke 10. Jesus is over at their house, at the home of Mary and Martha for, for dinner, and Martha is running around, working herself ragged, cooking and cleaning and preparing and being hospitable, but she spreads so thin in her work that she is stressed and anxious. She is marimna. Her mind is divided. She's distracted. She's split, and she's falling to pieces, anxious with far too many goals in that moment. Mary, on the other hand, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. Martha in her stress and her fatigue and her anxiety, starts to get a little hot under the collar toward her sister. She's like, Mary, there's a gazillion things to be doing right now. We've got company, and you're having your quiet time. And Mary's like, all that other stuff is secondary. The house can be a wreck. 
There can be a million other things to do, but I'm going to have my time with Jesus. Martha, you do realize the Messiah is in our living room, right? Listen to what Jesus says here to the ladies. He said specifically to Martha, but the Lord said to her, this is in Luke 10, 41, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset, Marimna, over all these details. You're falling to pieces. You're split. You're divided. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Notice the comparison. you got all these things you're worried about, but he boils it down to one thing, single-mindedness. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary's or Martha's focus is divided, split apart. It's in pieces, which is why she is anxious. And Mary is over here in perfect peace because she found the most important thing and she's being single-minded about it. Jesus says to Martha, Mary's focused on the one thing. You're worried about 300 things. Now, I'm one of those 300 things. That's nice. I'm glad to be one of the 300 things you're thinking about, but your lack of focus on the right thing isn't hurting me. It's hurting you. It's making you anxious and upset. Jesus is telling all of us something here. He's showing us how to find peace in a chaotic world. He's telling us how to possess peace when we're overwhelmed and anxious. The opposite of your anxiety is single-mindedness. It is a focus on the right thing. And that's how you cultivate peace in your life. That's exactly what Paul told us in Philippians 4. Look, look again at verse 8. Brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. He just told us, don't worry. Pray about everything. He's talking about worry, anxiety. He says, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Focus. Think your thoughts on what is true and honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. And keep doing it. Keep putting it into practice. Not one time. It's got to be habitual. And then, he says, then the God of peace will be with you. If you're an anxious person or you're lacking biblical peace, Paul and Jesus are telling you the same thing. They're telling you how to get it. Fix your thoughts. Focus. Think. Remember. Keep putting it into practice. Keep on doing it daily, consistently, repetitively. And third, then the peace of God will be with you. Every one of us has a choice when we battle against the world, our own sin nature, and our spiritual enemy. You can listen to your heart, or you can talk to your heart. The culture tells you to listen to your heart. The Bible tells you to talk to your heart, guide your heart, inform your heart, direct your heart. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, the world slaps you in your face, your heart is going to start expressing worry. How are we going to pay for that? How is this ever going to work out? What will we ever do about this? And anxiety is going to start to snowball. And you can listen to all of that, or you can make your heart listen to you. In Psalm 42, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. David was depressed. He was overwhelmed. He was worried. He was anxious. But he shifts his focus from all the things that are dividing him, splitting him, tearing him to pieces, to the one thing that has held him together. He says this, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. Notice the shift. I'm not going to listen to that anymore. I'm going to tell my heart what to believe. I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to focus on what is praiseworthy, on what is excellent, my Savior and my God Now I'm deeply discouraged. But when I focus, when I remember, I will remember you. When worry and anxiety rush in, focus, think, remember. Don't forget who made you. Don't forget who saved you. Don't forget whose you are and who you are in Christ. Worry is listening to your heart. Peace comes by talking to your heart and reminding it who you are in Christ. It's focusing and thinking on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. But it's not just focusing on what is all those things. It's focusing on who is all those things. Who is truth? Who is honorable? Who is righteous? 
Who is pure? Who is lovely? Who is admirable? Who is excellent? Who is praiseworthy? The only one that is all of those things is Jesus. And that's the answer to that last question. What attribute of God does real peace originate from? Because when we focus on that, it cultivates peace in our life. Focus on the truth of Jesus, the honor of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, the purity of Jesus, the excellence of Jesus, the praiseworthiness of Jesus. Think on these things. So, adjust your expectations to the realities of life. And then, focus on this. Remember this. Direct your heart from the 300 things that are causing worry and tearing you to pieces. Become single-minded about the one thing that matters most, the one who has always held you together. Do what Mary did. Shut it all out. Sit at Jesus' feet, not just for a minute or two, or not one day or two, but keep doing that consistently. And then Paul says, the peace of God will be with you. Not because you're absent of conflict, but you have peace in the middle of the battle. Doing that will build your confidence and trust in God's wise control of your life. And that is the essence of biblical peace. Stand with me, if you will, across this room and across our campus family. And I'm going to ask our prayer team here in this service and then across our campus family if they will join at the front of all of their campuses and be prepared to serve you. I, I, I ran out of time, but let me just don't miss this. In, in Philippians 4, Paul is talking about the peace of God. In Romans 5, Paul says, we have been justified by faith. Now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans 5.1. The only way you will ever know the peace of God is to first have peace with God. And if your will is still at war with his, quit being the cat on the driftwood and fighting the one that's trying to rescue you and surrender. He's taking the punishment. He's paying the price, letting you fight so that one day you can eventually surrender. And today could be that day. And when you make peace with God, you'll finally be able to experience the peace of God. Lord, I pray for the people under the sound of my voice in this city or any others. There are those in this room that peace is a fleeting thing for them because they've never made peace with God. Their will, their nature is at war. And today, may it be a day of surrender where they say, Jesus, I don't want to just be religious. I want to give you my life. Let it be a moment of surrender where peace is made with God so that they can experience the peace of God. And for the believers in this room that have already done all of that, they, they have, they've had that moment of surrender, but the world, their sin nature, Satan, is trying to make them miserable by attacking their peace. God, would you help them take these principles and come to a place of total trust in your wise control of their life. May they rest in your goodness and your justice and your faithfulness today. I ask that you bless them and keep them and make your face shine down upon them. Be gracious to them. Turn your countenance their direction today. And Lord, more than any day before, I pray, would you give them peace. In Jesus' name.